Hello. Before we turn back to She Stoops to Conquer and then move on to Wilde's The Importance Being Earnest, um, I want to say a few things about writing comparative analytic essays. Um, the sheet that refers to this is one that I attached along with my email and the link to this lecture. Um, some of you may be familiar with what I'm going to suggest uh, by way of strategies. Um, others who have not done a lot of work on comparative essays, I think, will benefit from this in particular, though. All right. Um, all of the topics that you have ask you to compare two different characters or two different themes within plays. Um, the purpose of writing a comparative analytic essay is this. The underlying assumption in any comparative analysis that the two works that are under discussion have enough features in common to make an exploration of their differences enriching and interesting. The purpose of the comparison is to make the works then illuminate one another through contrast and discrimination, but there has to be some basic context of kinship, of similarity, otherwise you're comparing apples to oranges. You know, there's, there's no point in the comparison. There's no focus, all right? Now, the thesis for a comparative analytic essay is crucial. The heart of any comparative analysis is a discussion of the differences in the works, but you then have to first establish the context of similarity at the start of the essay as part of the thesis. Therefore, the thesis statement in a comparative analysis has to do two things. First, identify what the primary features of the two works are that they share, and then, as part of the same thesis, state the most important area of difference, okay? For example, Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice and Othello both feature a minority protagonist who faces racial prejudice in Christian Venice, where white society relies on their services. Whereas Shylock, a Jew, rails against this hypocrisy, Othello, a Moor by birth, takes pride in his service to the state. Okay, you'll note that this is a two-sentence thesis. The first sentence establishes the primary context of similarity. They are both minorities, both face racial prejudice, and yet are relied upon. The second sentence establishes the most important point of difference. Not the only one that you're going to elaborate, but the most important part, which is that Shylock, from the beginning, regards Christian um, use and reliance, uh, given the uh, prejudice as hypocrisy, whereas Othello takes pride in his service to the state and sees no hypocrisy. All right? Now, when it comes time to organize a comparative analysis, and clearly you have to make the decision on how you're going to organize it, I think, before you actually write your thesis. But when you're trying to determine the organizational structure, there are two basic models, okay? And they will follow directly after your thesis sentence, even though, as I've suggested, you should decide on one of them before you write your thesis sentence. Here they are. The first organizational model in a comparison is a block structure, okay? I have it as A and then B, but B with a parenthetical A. What do I mean? Well, here you devote roughly the first half of the essay after the thesis statement to an analysis of one work, okay? And then you turn to the second work or the second character or whatever the nature of the comparison is in the second part of the essay, the remainder of the essay. However, your discussion of that second work in the latter part of the paper has to refer back to the first work. That's what I mean by the B, but with a parenthesis. That parenthetical A is a reference back to the first work, okay? Even when you're talking about work B. Because unless you integrate important aspects of the first work into your discussion of the second, then what you really have are two separate mini-essays, not a comparative analysis. There's simply no comparison, all right? Now, the second and somewhat trickier organizational model is the braided structure, okay? A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, et cetera. Here, you proceed on a point-by-point -point basis 
devoting a full paragraph to a focused analysis of a particular issue in the two works that you're contrasting, and then moving on to a focused analysis of another issue that you're contrasting. The keys to the success of this structure are finding a coherent sequence for the comparative points that you intend to discuss and developing each of those points sufficiently to fill uh, you know, a complete paragraph rather than a series of little bullet points. Now this method, as you may infer, requires more meticulous planning than the block model, but it can also provide greater focus and precision. So how do you choose a model? Well, I would say if you've never written a comparative analysis before, or very few, the block model is probably um, the better choice, just because I think it is easier to manage. But the fact is that there are advantages and also potential drawbacks in both of these models. In making the choice, consider the length and the complexity of the works or the particular questions that you're analyzing, and also consider the number of comparative points that you intend to make. Here's the strength and weakness of the block model. The block model is more for it's straightforward. Okay, It's less intricate, and it can often be more cohesive. It's usually easier for uh, writers unfamiliar with comparative analyses to master. The challenge lies in integrating the two works, as I've noted, though, in the second part of the essay. All right, The first part of the essay will seem very familiar to you. You're analyzing a single work or a single question uh, regarding a character or a theme. It's the second half of the essay where you have to do the integrating, where you have to refer back to that first work frequently. But you have to refer back with economy and precision. Because if you return to that first work at too great a length, then you run the risk of repetition, of saying the same thing that you've already established. You have to um, go back to it uh, in a more economical way, okay, and not simply restate everything about it that's already been established. The braided model, um, the advantage is that it provides a more carefully focused and controlled comparison of the works. But here, the challenge is to avoid a fragmented and disjunctive commentary, by which I mean a series of short paragraphs um, that aren't fully developed because you don't have enough to say about all of them, and that tend to jump from topic to topic rather than um, being part of a smooth continuum. So in order to avoid those two pitfalls in a braided model, really you have to do three things. First, establish points of comparison that are rich or complex enough so that you really can fill a paragraph with each one of them. Second, determine a logical sequence that will allow you to move smoothly from one comparative point to another uh, so that there seems to be a logic. And it's although you're certainly going to start with the most important point of contrast, after that, um, you don't have to go in any strict succession of relative importance. After the first one, after you've developed that, then move in the direction that seems most logically connected to it. And finally, to support that sense of continuity and cohesion, find transitional language that will carry your reader from paragraph to paragraph so that it doesn't seem uh, as if you are abruptly shifting ground each time you indent. Okay, I will be happy to talk to you all about this in further detail after you have chosen what your topic is and when, as I've asked, you get in touch with me and tell me what that topic is. I'm also going to ask you which of these approaches you want to use and offer some suggestions on how you might do that. All right? So, with that in mind, we turn back to She Stoops to Conquer. Now, at the end of Act 3, which is where we had gotten last time, Marlowe, mistaking Kate for a tavern maid at the inn, where he imagines he's staying on his way to Hardcastle's house, attempts to seduce her with crude, cliché-ridden lines about the nectar of her lips and demands that she show him the embroidery in her room. Now, as we saw, Kate not only repels these ridiculous verbal advances, and also Marlowe's attempts to kiss and embrace her, but she, in doing so, calls his attention 
to his double standard of conduct around women. She notes that earlier in the day, she witnessed how he had stammered with downcast eyes when he talked to the elegant, dre elegantly dressed Kate. Marlowe, in an aside, says she has hit sure enough. She knows, she looks knowing me thinks. Hmm. That is, he realizes that this woman has seen through his inconsistent behavior. But more important, he realizes that she has seen his underlying insecurity with women, even as he is parading around here like a kind of ladies' man. This woman, who he thinks is a barmaid, realizes that both of Marlowe's extreme forms of conduct with women are responses to his insecurity, and that both the extreme modesty and the braggadocio are therefore unnatural performances. She realizes that neither is the real Marlowe, and Marlowe seems to understand that she sees this. Now, the one mode of conduct in Marlowe, of course, is overly decorous and timid. The other, as we've just seen, is overly bold, uh, reciting tired lines of attempted seduction in some kind of naive imitation of a popular masculine model. Well, Marlowe sees that the woman uh, that he doesn't know is Kate has seen these things, seen the falsity of this performance. Yet, at the start of Act Four, Marlowe nonetheless tries to revert to the role of a worldly ladies' man by bragging to Hastings about his would-be conquest. This is, of course, a futile attempt on Marlowe's part to recover from what Kate has uh, exposed about him and clearly destabilized him. His claim to Hastings that, quote, she talked of showing me her work is, of course, a desperate lie. She did nothing of the kind. Um, and it's desperate because, of course, the woman rejected his advances and he is crestfallen at this and confused at what she saw in him. Now, Hastings, of course, knows that the woman he's referring to was Kate. And when he asks Marlowe how he can go about trying to rob a woman of her honor, Marlowe reveals the full measure of his class prejudice with regard to women when he replies that a barmaid has no such honor to rob. That is, Marlowe suggests she must sleep with anyone who will pay her, which Marlowe brags that he plans to do. Now, this is all, of course, a cover-up for the sexual and social insecurity that Kate has forced Marlowe to see in himself and to see with pain that she has spotted it. But obviously, Marlowe needs to face that prejudice and the class bias that underlies his appallingly narrow assumptions about lower-class women, the idea that they are basically courtesans, this is an incredibly naive and prejudicial view that will have to be corrected. It's only when Hastings chastens Marlowe by telling him that the woman in question, indeed, uh, has honor, by implication that she is a virgin, it's only then that Marlowe backtracks and says, well, in that case, he would never think of stealing her honor, stealing her virginity. Now, earlier in the play, after their first meeting, Kate, you remember, had vowed to, quote, teach Marlowe a little confidence to help him overcome his insecurity with women like herself. But we now realize that that's not going to be enough. She'll have to do more than simply teach him confidence to make him worthy of her as a husband. We realize that she'll also have to punish Marlowe's misogyny and the class prejudices that stand behind it. Uh, what she had referred to... Uh, as the enemy force within him. She'll have to, uh, in some way, uh, combat that, correct it, um, in here, in what uh, Hardcastle calls uh, Liberty Hall, okay? A place where it would seem uh, no uh, hard and fast and prejudicial class distinctions are welcome. Now, at the same time, Kate is going to have to uncover the true Marlowe as opposed to the unnatural poses and roles that she has seen him playing at opposite extremes of behavior. And beyond that, Kate is going to have to prove both to herself 
and to her father that this figure, this guy Marlowe, is capable of loving her for herself, not as a function of her rank. Only if Kate can succeed then in teaching Marlowe, punishing Marlowe, and discovering what Marlowe is capable of, only then will it seem Marlowe is worthy of her love. Well, Act 4 begins with another reversal, or one might say a reversal of the earlier reversal, in which Mrs. Hardcastle lied uh, that Constance's gems were stolen and finds that it proves true. It proves true when Tony pilfers them and the woman who had, hypo, who had hypocritically preached calm resignation to her niece now runs about shrieking hysterically uh, like Shylock in the streets that she was robbed, plundered, broken open, undone. But now this reversal of fortune, uh, which cast uh, her down, and the plan for Hastings and Constance to elope with the gems is itself overturned at the beginning of Act 4. We learn that Tony gave the chest of gems that he stole to Hastings. Hastings, in turn, gave it to the unsuspecting Marlowe and asked his friend to put it in the carriage for safekeeping, the carriage in which Hastings and Constance were to flee. Instead, Marlowe, uh, because he doesn't know about or understand Hastings' plan, gives the chest to a servant to give to the so-called landlady of the inn that he imagines to put it into storage. That is, he gives it indirectly back to Mrs. Hardcastle. This mistake poses the question of why Hastings has concealed the truth about his planned elopement with Constance from his dear friend Marlowe just as he and Constance, you remember, have also concealed from Marla the fact that they are actually in the Hardcastle house rather than at an inn. Is it that Hastings doesn't trust Marlowe? I don't think so. If that were the case, he certainly wouldn't trust him with the gems to begin with. The only explanation for this important omission of information, oh, by the way, I'm giving you this because Constance and I are going to elope, the only explanation for that omission is something implied in Hastings' name, that he is too hasty, too impetuous in his drive to flee with Constance and has simply failed or forgotten to explain what's going on to Marlowe. Meanwhile, Marlowe is having problems of his own. Hardcastle has received enough impertinent insults from Marlowe that it's gotten to the point where he throws Marlowe out. Uh, Marlowe is puzzled because thinking he's it in, Marlowe uh, believes that he has been doing the innkeeper a favor, helping the establishment sell alcohol by encouraging his traveling attendants to get drunk. <laughs> this is simply too much, this behavior for um, uh, Hardcastle to bear. And it leads to the climax of the misunderstanding that Tony had engineered, you'll remember, at the end of Act 1 when he misdirected Marlowe and Hastings to what they thought was an inn. Now, <clears throat> Hardcastle says, Mr. Marlowe, sir, I have submitted to your insult insolence for more than four hours, and I see no likelihood of its coming into an end. I'm now resolved to be master here, sir, and I desire that you and your drunken pack may leave my house directly. Marlowe is astonished at this. <laughs> he says, this your house, fellow? It's my house. This is my house, mine while I choose to stay here. <laughs> Who is this guy throwing me out? Hardcastle finds this absolutely inconceivable. And in a fit of sarcasm, he says, your house? Well, then, <clears throat> when Marlowe says, bring me the bill, oh, here, take a set of prints. What do you think of the rake's progress? Say for your own apartment, take it and then a little bit later, and then there's a mahogany table uh, that you may see your own face in. Take that too, Marlowe says. My bill, I say, sir, to which Hardcastle says, oh, and I'd forgot the great chair for your own particular slumbers after a heavy meal. Marlowe, zounds, bring me the bill. Okay, now, Hardcastle's sarcasm here, his incredulity, um, contains some coded insults. First, there's the reference to Hogarth's series of paintings 
the Rake's Progress, of which Hardcastle owns prints. Um, it depicts this series, the way in which a naive young man is corrupted by a life of indulgence in London. And this is exactly, of course, what Hardcastle assumes has happened to his friend Sir Charles Marlowe's son to, con to make him into such a, uh, uh, an impolite uh, boob. Hardcastle also refers to the polished mahogany table in which he says you can see your own face. Um, that too, he suggests, since you think you're entitled to everything, you might as well take that as well. Here Hardcastle calls attention to Marlowe's narcissism. You can see your face in it, while also suggesting that the young man should take a good hard look at himself, this son of Hardcastle's old friend who was so different from what he expected. It is only after this denunciation that Marlowe pauses for a moment, because after Hardcastle has walked out, he thinks about something. Hardcastle had made reference to Marlowe's father. How would an innkeeper know Sir Charles Marlowe? What is going on? Hardcastle says, young man, young man, from your father's letter to me, I was taught to expect a well-bred, modest man as a visitor here, but now I find him no better than a coxcomb and a bully. After Hardcastle exit, Marlowe says to himself, how's this? Sure, I have not mistaken the house. Everything looks like an inn. He's already beginning to have terrible self-doubts. Now, Marlowe's confusion builds then at this moment on the insecurity that Kate had earlier forced him briefly to confront in himself regarding all women okay, and the way that everything he has enacted is a kind of pose. And Marlowe brings that vulnerability and self-doubt now, caused both by Kate and now by Kate's father, to the third meeting that he has with Kate, okay? Now, in this meeting, why? When Marlowe says that he fears he has made a mistake about where he is, why doesn't Kate immediately correct him about who she is. Instead, she confirms that yes, this is Hardcastle's house. It's not an inn, but she doesn't reveal herself as Hardcastle's daughter. Rather, Kate now says that she isn't a barmaid either, but rather a poor relation of the family who is there working for Mr. Hardcastle. <clears throat> she says, that um, after uh, Marlowe says that he's been damnably imposed upon, oh, confound my stupid head, I should be laughed at all over town. What a swaggering puppy they must take me for. What a puppy I find myself. After he condemns himself this way and speaks of uh, my stupidity, I saw everything the wrong way, he turns and looks at Kate. And she says, I hope, sir, I have done nothing to disoblige you. I'm sure I should be sorry people said anything amiss since I have no fortune but my character. Hmm. Marlowe then in his side says, by heaven she weeps. This is the first mark of tenderness I ever had from a modest woman and it touches me. And then turning back to Kate, who he believes is a poor relation of the family, he says, excuse me, my lovely girl, you are all the only part of the family I leave with reluctance. But to be plain with you, the difference of our birth, fortune, and education makes an honorable connection impossible, and I can never harbor a thought of seducing simplicity that trusted in my honor or bringing ruin upon one whose only fault was being too lovely. Then Kate to herself and aside says, Generous man, I now begin to admire him. Well, what exactly is Kate up to here? Why not reveal herself rather than deceiving Marlowe in this new way by claiming she's a poor relation? Well, she does this first, I think, to make Marlowe suffer so that he can learn how narrow and absurd his class consciousness is, especially regarding women. And indeed, his self-laceration and acute embarrassment at the beginning, as we saw when he speaks of himself as uh, one who will be laughably uh, a caricature all over town. Uh, I shall be stuck up as a caricature in the print shops. My stupidity is so amazing. I saw everything the wrong way. Kate um, knows um, that that self-laceration and acute embarrassment indicate that he's already suffering terrible mortification 
he knows that he's behaved, uh, behaved like an ass and will have to answer to his father for it, but that he needs to suffer more. Kate also knows, and this is yet another reason why she doesn't tell him the truth, she knows that if Marlowe then learned the entire truth, learned that he had been trying to put the moves, in fact, on <coughs> Kate Hardcastle earlier, he would realize that he had been an absolute cad with the woman who he thought was a barmaid but was actually the entire time the woman that he was there to court that his father had selected for him. And in response to that, what would he have done? He would almost certainly, in that mortification, this man who is so sensitive to the way others see him, he would have fled. Uh, and that would have been the end of any possible relationship between them. He would have fled before Kate could teach him the kind of um, freedom from class consciousness that he needs to learn, and before she could discover in him what Marlowe was really capable of. But there's a third and more important reason why Kate doesn't disclose everything here and pretends to be this poor cousin. Um, and it is because through the rouge, she hopes to determine what Marlowe is like when he isn't behaving either with artificial modesty around a fine lady or with a kind of artificial swagger and um, cliche-ridden uh, braggadocio around a woman he thinks is of the lower classes. Um, so a poor relation then to a good family, you might say, this claim she makes for herself now is between those two extremes, between the fine lady and the barmaid. And Kate presents this because she wants to know if Marlowe can act naturally with her in this more medium guise um, than he had before. And more important, she wants to know if he could love her in this guise and want to marry her even if she isn't, in his mind, a rich man's daughter. Well, in this respect, one might say, what Kate is imposing on Marlowe in this scene then is a test. Can he demonstrate that he could love a woman who is not of his own rank? Well, Marlowe's response here and afterward um, shows that he passes this test by answering Kate's questions, by allaying her concerns. First, it appears that he can act naturally and that he can love her, as he says. And eventually, it is also clear that he can free himself from class snobbery enough to uh, wish to marry her. Now, Marlowe didn't realize himself that he was capable of these things until Kate forced the discovery on him in the scene that I just read when Marlowe, much to his own surprise, uh, says, by heaven she weeps, this is the first mark of tenderness I've received, and it touches me. This is not something he's accustomed to. Um, now, note that when Marlowe then goes on to speak to her in the passage I read, uh, speaking of the difference of our birth that makes an honorable connection impossible, uh, and that he would never bring ruin upon her nonetheless because, in fact, um, he finds her so lovely. One of the things that you'll note here is that Marlowe's speech is different than we've ever heard it before, certainly different than when he was, refer was speaking to uh, Kate uh, as fine lady or as imagined barmaid. That speech was completely unnatural, but now he speaks in a way that is natural, heartfelt, and eloquent unlike the stammering attempt at elevated discourse when he saw Kate in her fine dress, it's also unlike the tedious crude language of his attempted at seduction. Both of those were completely contrived performances with completely contrived language. Not here. Marlowe has fallen in love with Kate for her combination, he says, of tenderness, kindness toward him despite his egregious uh, uh, misconstruction of where he was, and also her modesty. But he struggles here in this scene, not so much then to overcome his own class prejudices, though he's in the process of doing that, but he is struggling also 
with what he takes to be those of his family. Specifically, he is afraid to disappoint his father, Sir Charles. It is that that he says holds him back from uh, marrying her. Uh, Marlowe says, your partiality in my favor, my dear, touches me most sensibly. And were I to live for myself alone, I could easily fix my choice on you. But I owe too much to the opinion of the world and too much to the authority of a father so that I can scarcely speak it. It affects me. Farewell. Kate's response, I never knew half his merit till now. He shall not go if I have power of or art to detain him. I still preserve the character in which I stooped to conquer. But I will undeceive my father, and he will see what a good man he is. Now, note that um, this situation um, makes us go back to the central parent-child theme that runs throughout the play. Marlowe isn't in rebellion against a parent the way Tony is in rebellion against Mrs. Hardcastle, but neither is Marlowe confident that his father will give him the freedom to override his parental authority, if he wants to, the way Hardcastle has given Kate that freedom. The very fact, then, that Marlowe struggles this way, um, declaring that he would like to marry this woman, uh, this poor cousin, but feels that he cannot violate his father's will, that for Kate, that very struggle, is a sign of his moral sensitivity, of his capacity for love, of his respect for his father, in a word, of his worthiness, a worthiness she had sensed in him from the beginning and now sees fully manifest, all of which move her then to love him and to say, uh, after he has uh, left in this state, that he shall, have not go, shall not go if I have power to detain him. Yes, she's made her choice. Now, note that she has then conquered Marlowe's insecurity with women by getting him to open up to her uh, as a human being rather than uh, in relation to her class and to act naturally rather than through some sort of performed contrivance. And she has also conquered not just his insecurity, but his heart. She has done so, to use her own phrase, by stooping to conquer. And she's done so in two senses. She has stooped to the social level, uh, lower social level, of a poor relation. And she has also stooped to deception to get at the truth of Marlowe's character, revealing it to herself and to Marlowe, who seems never to have understood uh, his capacity for real love or nobility. Meanwhile, the play's other romantic scheme, which involves the deception of Mrs. Hardcastle, is moving less successfully. The servant has now given the jewels uh, back to Mrs. Uh, Hardcastle, and Constance and Tony are forced to pretend to flirt with each other in order to hide Constance's relationship <coughs> with Hastings. We find in this flirtation another instance of what I call double discourse, in which it's funny because the words have two <coughs> different meanings uh, for different listeners. As uh, Mrs. Hardcastle watches them, uh, Constance says to Tony, agreeable cousin, who can help admiring that natural humor, that pleasant, broad, red, thoughtless patting his cheek? Ah, bold face. Mrs. Hardcastle, ah, pretty innocence. <clears throat> to which um, Tony then says to Constance, I am sure I always loved Co Cousin Con's hazel eyes and her pretty long fingers that she twists this way and that over the harpsichords of the parcel of the bobbins and her curly hair. Now, you'll note that couched within what Mrs. Hardcastle takes as mutual compliments, Tony and Constance are privately insulting one another's appearance, uh, the one for being too crude with his red cheeks and the other for being too artificial with her harpsichord-like curls. Now, at this moment, Hastings is waiting in the carriage, ready to go without the jewels, and in his haste, he makes the mistake of writing to Tony and telling him to bring Constance down to meet him for departure. He just can't wait. But Tony is 
illiterate, something Hastings didn't know. And in one of the play's funniest scenes, Mrs. Hardcastle intercepts the letter from Hastings to Tony because her son is unable to read it or even to imagine who it's from or what might be in it. When it's handed to Tony, trying to read, it says, Dear Sir, uh, what's that? Then there's an M and, and a T and an S. But whatever that next is, is it or are confused, I, mean, I cannot tell. Mrs. Hardkissel says, what's that, my dear? Can I give you assistance? To which Constance immediately says, oh, no, pray, Aunt, let me read. Nobody reads a cramped hand better than I, twitching the letter from him, oh, and pretending to read, making it up. Dear sir, hoping that you're in health, I am at this point at present. Uh, the gentleman of the shake bag club has cut the gentleman of the goose green quite out of feather. The odds, mm, old, old battle and the long fighting up here. It's all about cocks and fighting and of no consequence. Here, put, put it up. Thrusting the cramped letter back to Tony, who then cluelessly says, oh, well, if there's a cock fight, then I'm off. Here, mother, do with it what you want. I'm out of here. Mrs. Hardcastle takes the letter then. Dear Squire, I'm now waiting for Miss Neville with the post chase and pair at the bottom of the garden, but I find my horse is yet unable to perform the journey. What? Now, we have here yet another reversal in a series of reversals in power. Remember, Bergson says that the mechanical nature of reversal upon reversal itself is inherently comic because it seems mechanistic, okay? It seems uh, in some ways so extreme, particularly when it's repeated. Well, no sooner does Miss Hardcastle, Mrs. Hardcastle realize the plot and who Hastings really is, this individual who had been complimenting her and who she didn't know was courting her niece, no sooner does she realize that than um, Mrs. Hardcastle prepares to send her niece Constance into exile at her aunt Pedigree's. So now it appears that Constance and Hastings are completely ruined as a couple. There are no gems to live on. There is no elopement. There is no possibility even for continuing their clandestine love affair. Hastings has been too busy, too impetuous. He's been unwilling to wait for Constance to reclaim her inheritance or to wait until she is of age for it, and now too impatient um, to um, wait a minute more before summoning her to the carriage uh, along with Tony to be off. In short, he has inadvertently, through his impatience, exposed their plot. The result of this in Act 4, in the latter part of Act 4, is discord. A discord in which the characters blame one another for this unfortunate turn of events. Tony and uh, Constance and Marlowe and Hastings are all engaged in this blame, and each feels betrayed by one or more of the others. Constance blames Tony for his illiterate stupidity in giving the letter to his mother. Hastings blames Tony as well, accusing him of betrayal in doing so. But Hastings also blames Marlowe for giving the gems to the servant. And Marlowe in turn blames his friend Hastings for not telling him about the elopement plans, which would have prevented him from giving them to a servant. Marlowe also blames Tony for misdirecting him and Hastings to Hardcastle's house under the belief that it was an inn. And Tony blames Constance for devising a scheme uh, that backfired because it was just too complicated. Thus, at a certain point in this escalating series of accusations, um, when uh, Constance has uh, suggested that uh, what better could be expected from being connected with such a fool as you, Tony, and after all the nods and signs I made with that letter, to which Tony says, by laws, miss, if you own cleverness and not my stupidity, that's what did this business. Yes, you were you were too complicated, okay? It was too too indirect. <clears throat> then enters Hastings. <clears throat> so, sir, I find my servant that you have shown my letter and betrayed us. That was well done, young gentleman, accusing Tony, to which Tony says, here's another. Ask Miss there who betrayed you. He caught. It's her doing, not mine. And now Marlowe enters. So I've been finally used here among you, rendered contemptible, driven into ill manners, despised, insulted, laughed at, Tony. And here's another. We shall all have old Bedlam broke loose presently. Yes, this is a madhouse. Well, the figure who is blamed the most in all of this mutual blame is, of course, Tony himself. Um, and it is only through Tony that it can be resolved. But this discord that I've just described, 
briefly disrupts the play's comic tone. And it may, in fact, even remind you a little bit of what occurs at the start of Act 5 in Tartuffe among Orgon's family after they're completely disinherited and disempowered by Tartuffe. But this discord doesn't last, and it doesn't pose the kind of threat that we get in Tartuffe after the con man has acquired Orgon's property and holds so much power over the family. We're not concerned about a comic outcome here as we were, I think, in that darker comedy because Mrs. Hardcastle is not, like Tartuffe, a dangerous, clever, and truly evil antagonist. Instead, not surprisingly, Act 4 ends on a hopeful note, with Tony um, plotting yet another prank, one that he assures all of the others will redeem their interests. Now, he doesn't explain it yet, so at the end of Act 4, we have this cliffhanger uh, to hold on to. Marlowe says to Tony, you see now, young gentleman, the effects of your folly. What might be amusement to you is here disappointment and even distress. Yes, you not only blown it with the letter, more particularly, you misdirected us here under false pretenses. Tony, from a reverie, Ecod, he's been thinking, I have hit it. It's here. Your hands, yours and yours, my poor sulky. Boots here, yes, shake. Meet me two hours hence at the bottom of the garden. If you don't find Tony Lumpkin a good, more good-natured fellow than you thought for, I'll give you leave to take my best horse and bet bouncer into the bargain. Come along, my boots. Whoa! All right. Act 5 opens on an encouraging note. Sir Charles, Marlowe's father, has arrived at Hardcastles as I think they had planned, and the two old friends are laughing at the mistaken identities that have occurred prior to this, specifically at Marlowe's impertinence and mortification on discovering, in fact, that he was in uh, the Hardcastle house. Goldsmith encourages his audience to laugh in a similar spirit of good-natured forgiveness, uh, laughing at oneself as well as others. Hardcastle says, ha, 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 the peremptory tone in which he sent forth his sublime commands to me. And Charles, Sir Charles says, and the reserve with which I suppose he treated all your advances. Oh, Hardcastle, and yet he might have seen something in me above a common innkeeper, too. Oh, to which Sir Charles says, yes, Dick, but he mistook you for an uncommon innkeeper. <laughs> well, Hardcastle is not offended, and he is not bitter when he realizes that uh, uh, Marlowe treated him that way out of a misunderstanding. Hardcastle can laugh both at Marlowe and, more important, at himself for his own confused indignation at not realizing who, Tony, who Marlowe thought he was. But the problem at this point is that Marlowe cannot laugh at himself the way Hardcastle can, at least not yet. Now, as we've seen, Marlowe is morbidly insecure about how others perceive him. Uh, the first thing he says after discovering uh, where he really is is, oh, I'll be laughed about all over London. There'll be uh, caricatures of me in the store windows. And he cannot then either forgive himself for his mistake or laugh at himself for it any more than he seems capable of forgiving Tony for misdirecting him there. And so in this state of morbid embarrassment, he prepares to withdraw from the house in shame, only after apologizing abjectly to Hardcastle. When Marlowe comes in, he says, I come, sir, once more to ask pardon for my strange conduct. I can scarce reflect on my insolence without confusion, which Hardcastle says forgivingly, tut boy, you take it all too gravely. No, no, not a big deal. Marlowe won't have it. Sure, sir, nothing has passed between us but the most profound respect on my side and the most distant respect on your daughter's. You don't think, sir, that my impertinence has passed beyond all the rest of the family. Now, remember that Marlowe uh, does not know that um, Hardcastle witnessed his behavior with what he thought was a barmaid, who was actually Kate. Um, nonetheless, he insists that he, he simply has to to leave. Um, uh, this overacting young gentleman, Hardcastle says, you know, you may be open, but, you know, let's, let's open up. You behaved, you behaved there rather cadishly, but okay, I forgive you for that as well. Well, note that at this point, Marlowe still doesn't know 
that the woman that he first tried to seduce and then fell in love with as a poor cousin is Kate, the woman whom he was too nervous to look at in the fine dress early in the day was also Kate. And Hardcastle doesn't know that Marlowe thought that he was talking to a barmaid when he acted so vulgarly toward his daughter. He's willing to overlook it, but he doesn't understand that. So, when Hardcastle says that he saw Marlowe behave aggressively in this way, uh, when um, he says that, uh, you know, in trying to deny that, you're overacting a little bit, you know, uh, that impotence, um, there is contention, there's, there's confusion, there's a problem. Uh, when he says that he saw him behave that way, Marlowe simply denies it because he certainly didn't think that the barmaid was, what he thought was the barmaid, was uh, Hardcastle's daughter. And this denial threatens the marriage that both Hardcastle and Sir Charles Marlowe are hoping to seal. Indeed, it causes a potential rift between the two old friends because Sir Charles wants to defend his son's claim that he did nothing untoward toward Kate Hardcastle and Marlowe, and, and on the other hand, uh, we have Hardcastle who believes he saw it with his own eyes. Sir Charles says, and have you never grasped her hand, son, or made any protestations? To which Marlowe says, as heaven is my witness, I came down in obedience to your commands, sir. I saw the lady without emotion and parted without reluctance. I hope you'll exact no further proofs of my duty, father, nor prevent me from leaving a house in which I suffer so many mortifications. And he walks out, to which Sir Charles says, I'm astonished at the air of sincerity with which he parted. And Cardcastle says, and I'm astonished at the deliberate intrepidity of his assurance. Essentially, my son's telling the truth, and no, your son is not telling the truth. So what can resolve this? Well, as the question of uh, Marlowe's truthfulness hangs in the air, Kate enters, uh, and they hope that she will be able to explain what is going on, but she does not explain to them yet her game. Instead, she tells the two men to hide and to watch as she conducts her fourth meeting now with Marlowe, still now claiming that she is the poor relation, one that will reveal Marlowe's true feelings for her, not just again to her, but to the two men. Now, this putting people in hiding to witness a scene is a technique we saw, of course, in Tartuffe. But there it was to expose Tartuffe's evil. Here it is meant to reveal to these two older men Marlowe's worthiness as a husband and as a man. Well, night has fallen, and the play's subtitle, The Mistakes of the Night, are now going to be played out, both for Marlowe and for Mrs. Hardcastle, uh, the primary but necessary victims of deception in this play. First, we learn about Tony's new trickery. He tells, Hard he tells Hastings that under the guise of taking uh, his uh, cousin Constance and Mrs. Hardcastle to Aunt Pedigree, he has instead driven them around the local area through hills and swamps for three hours and left his mother mired in the darkness where she has now gotten out of the carriage walked through a swamp and is staggering about not knowing where she is. Thus, Hardcastle, it seems, can now sneak away with Constance, or at least sneak Constance away from the carriage, and run off with her as planned, or as he had planned, to France, though again, without the jewels. Now, this reversal in power is, of course, based on Mrs. Hardcastle's uh, gullibility, because when she emerges from the carriage, she thinks that she is in a dangerous place, somewhere between her estate and at Pettigrew's. Um, not as she is on her estate. And she believes that the man who is approaching in the darkness is a highwayman, a robber, when actually it is, of course, Mr. Hardcastle out for an evening stroll. At his approach, um, Tony tells her to hide behind a tree to conceal herself, lest he see her. And at this point, of course, she has already been walking through a swamp 
And this woman who is so foolishly concerned with her hair and her clothing is, in Tony's words, quote, draggled up to the waist like a mermaid on stage. It's hilarious. She's covered with mud and dampness and leaves. Well, this is the crowning comic climax uh, that is about to incur. A final mistake in a play full of mistaken identities occurs when she imagines that <clears throat> Mr. Hardcastle, her husband, is a robber who um, is threatening their lives. Mrs. Hardcastle, running out from behind the tree, says, Oh, Lud, he'll murder my poor boy, my darling. Here, good gentleman, wet your rage upon me. Take my money, take my life, but spare the young gentleman. Spare my child if you have any mercy. To which Hardcastle says, My wife, as I'm a Christian, from whence can she come? Well, what does she mean? Mrs. Hardcastle, kneeling, take compassion on us, good Mr. Highwayman. Take our money, take our watches, all we have, but spare our lives. We will never bring you to justice. Indeed, we won't. Good, we, oh, we won't, Mr. Good Highwayman. When it becomes clear that Mr. Hardcastle uh, is indeed her husband uh, and says, I believe the woman's out of her wits. Dorothy, don't you know me? And she realizes indeed that it is her husband. Um, suddenly, things become clear to her. Sure, Dorothy, you've not lost your wits so far from home when you're within 40 yards of your own front door. Don't you know the gate and the mulberry tree? And don't you remember the horse pond there, my dear, that you just walked through? Mrs. Hardcastle, yes, I shall remember the horse pond as long as I live. I've caught my death in it. And turning to Tony then says, and it is to you, you graceless varlet, I owe all this. I'll teach you to abuse your mother, I will. To which Tony then, in a key line, replies, Hey, cod mother, all the parish says you have spoiled me, and so you may take the fruits on it. To which Mrs. Hardcastle says, I'll spoil you, I will. They go off stage, following one another. And then, to end the scene, Hardcastle says, There is morality, however, in his, that is, Tony's, reply. Now, beneath the hilarity of this scene of mistaken identity on Mrs. Hardcastle's part, uh, and beneath the hilarity of her failure to recognize her own husband and her own land, there is a more complex and serious edge. First, Mrs. Hardcastle, who has heretofore been supremely selfish, unexpectedly offers herself, her own life, to the would-be robber to save Tony's, take me instead of him. And we see then that while she is undeniably a bad parent, she really does love her son. The second interesting uh, and um, more complex suggestion in the scene is this. Tony now explains why he has betrayed and humiliated his mother and why he's been so eager to do so. It's because he thinks she deserves it. He blames her for, quote, spoiling him, not just by her attempts to manipulate him, but also for her own gain, but also through her overweening indulgence of him. Now, this revenge then um, is not um, undertaken, this humiliation of his mother. It's not just undertaken so that Constance and Hastings can get away, but it's something that Tony wants for himself. It's a kind of revenge. Is it just? Well, Hardcastle, who after all is no fan of Tony's himself, suggests that it is just. His wife has deserved it. Thus, he says at the end of the scene, in reference to Tony's accusation, there is morality in it. Okay. On the other hand, while Tony may see himself as spoiled and rightly blame his mother, he also makes it clear elsewhere that he has no intention of reforming his life. To recognize your life may be flawed is one thing. To want to change it is another. Nor is uh, Tony at all moved uh, by his mother's display of self-sacrificial love. Well, Tony's rebuke of her highlights the parent-child theme once again. While uh, Tony and Mrs. Hardcastle operate in a state of strife and mutual resistance and frustration, we've seen that Kate and Hardcastle operate in a uh, relationship of balance and compromise and mutual respect. But what about Marlowe and Sir Charles? Well, here things are a bit more big ambiguous. On the one hand, Sir Charles defends his son against the charge of sexual aggression uh, that um, goes with the description uh, Hardcastle has offered. Uh, but on the other, Marlowe seems to regard his father 
more with fear than with loving respect, at least at first. Yet he does think enough of his father's judgment that he feels sure that Sir Charles will approve his love for the poor cousin when he finally summons up the courage to declare that that's what he wants. Um, when he presents it to um, uh, Kate, it is in um, that belief. He says, I am now determined to stay, madam, to stay here, and I have too good an opinion of my father's discernment when he sees you to doubt his approbation, to doubt his approval. He's afraid of his father, but he respects ultimately that his father will approve of this choice, even though she's far uh, below uh, his father and his own station. Well, what about um, Constance in this uh, paternal relationship? Well, she has no living parent to advise her, and she has, in the absence of a parent, been preyed upon by Mrs. Hardcastle, who is trying to gain control of her fortune. She's also under pressure from Hastings, once again, to run off without her inheritance. But now she resists him more forcibly than she had done before and suggests that, no, uh, your haste has already gotten us in trouble. I'm not going to do that. She says, my spirits are so sunk with the agitations I have suffered that I un am unable to face any new danger with you. Two or three years' practice will at last crown us with happiness if you will only wait. Hastings then says, such a tedious delay is worse than inconstancy. Oh, no, let us fly, my charmer. No, Mr. Hastings, no, she said. Prudence once more comes to my relief, and I will obey its dictates. In the moment of passion, fortune may be despised, but it ever produces a lasting repentance if you turn away from the money that's yours. I am resolved then to apply to Mr. Hardcastle's compassion and justice for redress. Now, you'll note then that um, what she plans to do is to seek in Mr. Hardcastle a kind of surrogate father. In the absence of a parent, she will turn to him for advice and support in the face of her dilemma, and wisely. But first, before we go any further with that, let us consider the final encounter of Kate and Marlowe, in which he declares his love and his intention to marry her. Every moment I converse with you, he said, steals in some new grace, steals in some new grace, and heightens the picture of you, and gives me gives it stronger expression. Nor shall I ever feel repentance, but it not seeing your merits before. I'm sorry I didn't see when I saw you before, and I was so fresh. What a woman you are! What a fine woman! So I will stay, even contrary to your wishes, and though you should persist to shun me, I will still stay. I will make my respectful assiduities atone for the levity of my past conduct. To which Kate then, stringing him along, says, But seriously, Mr. Marlowe, do you think I could ever submit to a connection with you where I must appear mercenary and you imprudent? Do you think I could ever catch at the confident addresses of a secure admirer? To which Marlowe then, kneeling, kneeling, says, Does this look like security? Does this look like confidence? No, madam. Every moment that shows me your merit only serves to increase my diffidence and confusion. Well, we see that um, Marlowe's intentions here are entirely virtuous. He wants now to marry what he takes to be a poor cousin, regardless of her social station. But what are Kate's intentions here in drawing out this scene? Well, I think there are several. First, she wants to test the full measure of Marlowe's love for her by initially resisting him on the grounds that she'll be viewed as a fortune hunter and he will lose social credit if he marries someone beneath him. Marlowe passes that test when he declares his love and affirms that he will marry her even though he thinks she is poor. Second, Kate delays here because she wants to test to see if he'll repent for his earlier sins uh, when he attempted to uh, embrace and kiss and seduce her that were based on class snobbery. Will he repent? 
He says he will. Indeed, he repents for not recognizing her virtue earlier when he thought she was a barmaid. And even more, he repents for that class snobbery by kneeling, humbling himself before this poor relation as he takes her to be. Thus, he passes the test um, of uh, learning to overcome class consciousness both by kneeling and by repenting for the way he had treated her earlier. He has, it seems, learned to respect all women independent of their status socially. Now, at this point, Sir Charles and Hardcastle have heard enough and they burst out of hiding to congratulate Marlowe and Kate on what they see now is an inevitable uh, match that has been sealed here. Um, and note that at this point, uh, it appears that since Marlowe has essentially declared his love and intention to marry Kate, all that needs is uh, their final congratulatory approval. Well, all of the play's dramatic irony has led to this moment because it is the moment in which Marlowe will finally be disabused of his uh, belief that uh, Kate is someone other than Kate. Um, and when this emerges, when Marlowe says daughter, Marlowe said, uh, when Cardcastle refers to her as his daughter, Marlowe says, daughter? This lady? Your daughter? Yes, sir, my only daughter, my Kate. Who else should she be? Oh, the devil. Oh. <laughs> to which Kate says, yes, that very identical tall squinting lady you were pleased to take me for, curtsying, she that you addressed <clears throat> as the mild, modest, sentimental man of gravity and the bold, forward, agreeable rattle of the ladies' club. <laughs> Marlowe cannot laugh at himself, cannot forgive himself. Zounds, there's no bearing. This is worse than death. I must be gone. To which Hardcastle says, Be the hand of my body, but you shall not leave. I see it was all a mistake, and I am rejoiced to find it. You shall not, sir, I tell you. You shall not leave. I know she'll forgive you. Won't you forgive him, Kate? We'll all forgive you. Take courage, man, they retrieve. And she's still teasing him when they do, trying to get him to laugh at himself. That may be a test that he can pass only at the end of the play, because at this point he's enduring it, but he's not laughing. Marlowe doesn't answer. But the fact that he stays at all, even under Hardcastle's command, is a sign both of his love and of the general forgiveness in which he partakes. Uh, and we hope that he forgives others for their tricks and suppressions of truth and forgives himself as well. What Kate had spoken of earlier as the force in Marlowe that she wanted to combat, to understand and combat, that is to say his absorption of snobbish misogyny from his London peer group, that force in Marlowe that she has assessed and forced him to overcome, that force has given way in Marlowe to respect, not just for women uh, independent of their classes, but it's also given respect in Marlowe um, to Hardcastle's more democratic and enlightened approach to patriarchy uh, and more enlightened and democratic approach uh, in Liberty Hall, so to speak, to the class structure. Thus, Hardcastle pronounces in this atmosphere a benediction as the play ends with the upcoming marriage, not just of Kate and Marlowe, but also of um, the now um, reconnected with her wealth, Constance and Hastings. And multiple marriages are a staple of English comedy from Shakespeare all the way into the 19th century, and certainly here in the 18th century. <clears throat> Marlowe uh, as stands as Howard Kissel joins his hand to Kate's in a kind of preliminary to the wedding ceremony. And I say too, Mr. Marlowe, if she makes as good a wife as she is a daughter, I don't believe you'll ever repent your bargain. So now to supper tomorrow, we shall together all gather of the parish about us, and the mistakes of the night shall be crowned with a merry morning. So, boy, take her as you have been mistaken in the mistress. My wish is that you shall never be mistaken in the wife. Well, to bring this happy ending about, 
Goldsmith resorts to two rather creaky plot devices. First, the mention of the law that says that if Tony rejects his cousin in marriage when he's 21, he gets, she then gets to keep her fortune. This will um, allow her, of course, Constance, to marry Hastings without eloping uh, because the fortune will be hers and she need not worry about it as she has. And the second uh, plot device that we get uh, is the revelation that Tony is in fact already 21, but that his mother has suppressed that information from him so that uh, she could control um, his finances. Indeed, Tony controls his own. And what will he do with it? Well, just what he's been doing, drink and wench as before, but now he decides that he will do it in London of all places. And in the final epilogue that we get from Marlowe, spoken by Tony, uh, he says, well, now's all's ended. My comrades are gone. Pray what becomes of the mother's only son? Well, to town I'll fix my station and try to make a bluster of the nation. And in London, what will he do? In London, gad, they've some regard for spirit. I see the horses prancing in the street and Big Bet Bouncer bobs to all she meets. Big Bet Bouncer, the woman that he desires, his, uh, his lower class uh, wench, she'll be there with him and he'll be doing the same thing in London as he's been doing here. Marlowe changes. Tony does not, cannot. He just changes location. And really, would we want Tony to be any different? Okay, that concludes our discussion of She Stoops to Conquer. Now we turn our attention to Oscar Wilde. Okay. Here we are. Now, with Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, we stay in Great Britain. But we move over a century forward in the history of dramatic comedy from the mid-18th century to the late 19th. That is to say, we move to the Victorian period, named after the Queen who reigned from the 1830s all the way into the beginning of the 20th century. Wilde was, by all accounts, one of the wittiest men who ever lived. When uh, writers interviewed in the Sunday Times book review are asked to name um, three authors that they would like to invite to dinner. Wilde's name is mentioned more than any other because he was a famous raconteur, a peerless entertainer, a, a flamboyant provocateur. He dressed outrageously. He skewered all forms of solemnity, and he made no attempt to hide his homosexuality, even though he was married and had children. Born in Ireland, like Goldsmith, Wilde, also like Goldsmith, moved to London when he became, uh, where he became an absolute sensation very quickly. He became a sensation not just as an essayist and as a playwright, but most of all as a public wit. Um, he was also one of the leading members of what was known in the 1880s and 90s as the aesthetic movement in literature, uh, a movement that championed the idea of art for art's sake, of beauty as more important than truth, and of art as concerned uh, only with beauty and not at all with moral questions. Wilde was particularly fascinated by the relationship between life and art, and he proposed a paradoxical claim that instead of art imitating life, as had often been suggested, that actually life imitates art. By this wild meant that when we read a novel or see a painting, we absorb the impressions and that those impressions unconsciously inform the way we behave and see the world. Uh, we see it and behave through the lens of what we have absorbed from art. He claimed, for example, that no one really ever saw fogs in London until the Impressionist began painting them and people began seeing the world of London through those aesthetic associations. Now, the idea that life imitates art is only one of many, many paradoxes for which Oscar Wilde is famous. And he loved 
paradox, as we shall see in the importance of being earnest. As an aesthete, Wilde believed in living in art, something formed and beautiful, uh, an alternative to living in the chaotic, ugly, brutal messiness that we call life. But how do you do so? Well, Wilde, during the course of his career, proposed several different ways of living in art, of living the aesthetic life, and he did so in essays like The Decay of Lying and The Critic as Artist, in his famous epigrams that he collected, and also in his novel, uh, The Picture of Doring and Gray. There are a number of different ways in which Wilde suggested one could li live the aesthetic life. Here are some. First, you can do it by surrounding yourself with exquisite objects, um, beautiful works of visual art in particular, and thereby sealing out the ugly, um, disordered world around you outside you, uh, to seal it out by cultivating refined sensations uh, by surrounding yourself with these beautiful things. Uh, the decadent Lord Henry Wotton, for example, in the picture of Dorian Gray does this in, in a kind of extreme way. A second form of the aesthetic life was to um, practice what Wilde called the art of literary criticism. Wilde noted that the critic doesn't deal directly with life the way an artist very often has to. Um, rather, the critic treats the already formed work of art. And out of that work of art that already has formal unity, Wilde suggests the critic doesn't so much interpret its meaning as invent meanings or sort of spin out fanciful theories and ideas of his own to create art out of art. Um, but a more refined art, the art of criticism that is less contaminated with life because it is already removed from life by um, the uh, fact that it is engaged with a work of art. This is what Wilde meant when he spoke of the critic as artist, not the critic of art, but rather the act of criticism itself as a kind of higher second stage form of creation and Wilde indeed saw himself as such an artist as critic. A third way of living, leading the uh, aesthetic life for Wilde um, is this. If one has to be an artist and actually uh, engage life and try to give shape to it, um, well, there are different ways to do that. In the picture of Doring and Gray and in Wilde's play Salome, for example, he suggests that if you are going to create art, as opposed to the art of criticism, that that art should be as unrealistic as possible. Rather than trying to copy life, uh, as realistic novels in the 19th century did, Wilde suggested you should make your stories or your poetry or your plays as artificial, as contrived, as fantastic as possible. Well, no one would ever call The Importance of Being Earnest a realistic play, even though it's a comedy of manners with a social setting that might seem familiar and that Wilde gently satirizes. The fact is that the plot of this play is so deliberately contrived and freighted with wild coincidences that Wilde is laughing at realism in the process. In short, in The, uh, in the Importance of Being Earnest, um, we find an illustration of what Wilde suggests in his famous essay, The Decay of Lying. The point of art is to lie. Artists should lie. They should never hold a mirror up to the world as it is, but rather present a version of life that is fanciful, hyper-imaginative, as far from life as we know it as you can get. Finally, fourth, and most important, I think, for Wilde, one can live the aesthetic life, live in art, by making oneself the primary work of art through an elaborate style of dress. Uh, Wilde would dress from very historic, his very historical periods from, from the Renaissance all the way up uh, into contemporary times through styles of language. Create yourself as a public persona with society as its audience, or better yet, don't just create a single persona through style of dress and speech and manner. Create a variety, a number of persona. 
because for Wilde, in the absence of any under, underlying authentic self, and he believed that we had no underlying self at all, in the absence of that, the individual is free to create himself or herself as any direction they like and to recreate themselves in as many different poems as possible. As Wilde then famously put it, I put my talent into my work and my genius into my life, that is, into the work of art that is my life. He was his own greatest creative work. Now, The Importance of Being Earnest was first performed in 1895, and it marked the high point of Wilde's celebrity and literary success. A terrible fall followed. Just a few days after the opening of the play, Wilde became involved in a quarrel with the Marquise of Queensbury, a wealthy, aristocrat, very highly connected individual who happened to be the father of Wilde's young male lover, Alfred Douglas. Wilde was, at Queensbury's instigation, arrested on charges of sodomy and committing what were called gross acts of indecency with another male person. After a famous trial, Wilde was found guilty on these charges and was sent to prison. And when he reemerged two years later, Wilde was a changed man. He was broken and bankrupt. He died two years later in 1900 at the age of 46 after being received into the Catholic Church. In short, Wilde was a very different figure than the one who wrote the sparkling comedy that we're reading because Wilde became, through that ordeal, the very thing that he mocks in The Importance of Being Earnest, and that is earnestness. The most ironic of men became, near the end of his life, an earnest man, a sincere man. Now you'll note the spelling of earnest in the title, E-A-R-N-E-S-T, uh, a play uh, on the name Ernest, E-R-N-E-S-T. Um, but the emphasis on the adjective, uh, the, the word sincere and straightforward, that's what it means, and that, as we'll see, is precisely what, in this play, Wilde mocks consistently. Um, certainly, when Wilde wrote this play. He was the least earnest man that one could imagine. Um, but much of late Victorian society was, in his view, overly earnest, and so Wilde delights in satirizing its earnestness, its steadfastness, its sense of seriousness and uh, about itself, its honest self-regard, all of these aspects of earnestness. Um, but he satirizes them, I think you'll see, not in the vitriolic form of satire, say, with which Moliere attacks religious hypocrisy, uh, but mocks them enough to ruffle feathers at times, but never to profoundly offend. He doesn't want to. Wilde playfully emphasizes throughout the play the importance of not being earnest in a society that took its morals and manners, he felt, way too seriously and it was far too often earnest and sincere um, about uh, itself, particularly the British middle class. So what kind of comedy then is this play? Or to put it another way, what makes us laugh? Well, I think it's a complex blend of several elements. First, the play is a farce, a type of comedy, you remember, marked by buffoonery and pranks and ludicrously improbable situations. Uh, a situation, for example, like the ludicrous one in which two women uh, will only marry a man named Ernest. But unlike most farces, uh, certainly throughout literary history, which involve crude lower class characters, Wilde sets his farcical story amid the aristocracy, who emerge as deeply silly, ridiculous in their hidebound habits and attitudes. Now, insofar as it's a farce, the play then makes no claims at realistic plausibility. The plot is deliberately and deliciously preposterous, if you think of it. Two men, Jack and Algernon, uh, both pretend that they are named Ernest to court two women, Gwendolyn and Cicely, who have always loved the name Ernest and say they will only marry a man with that name. One of the men, Jack, is an orphan who, has, uh, who was left 
in Victoria Station, at the train station in London, in a handbag. And by the wildest of Wildian coincidences, the woman who left Jack there, Miss Prism, is the governess of a young woman, Cecily, who is Jack's ward. That is, uh, he uh, has been assigned uh, to guard her until she comes to uh, of age. Um, now, the plot is so deliberately far-fetched then that Wilde seems to be laughing at the very idea of literary plot itself, as if to suggest that any plot is a contrivance. Uh, and he is certainly, in particular, in this plot, mocking realistic drama, not just for its earnestness, um, but for its attempt somehow to simulate uh, the way in which life actually unfolds. But the play's humor isn't just farcical. That's not the only thing we laugh at. Uh, the importance of being earnest is also comic because within this excessively silly plot, uh, there is dazzling wordplay. Wordplay that generates laughter through irony and paradox and thought. Wilde delights us by constantly overturning what we nominally thought was true, but forces us to re-examine in these inversions. These paradoxes make us both laugh at the inversion of what was familiar, but also to think about that inversion and the extent to which it's true. For example, um, Cecily tells Algernon, as we'll see later, I hope you are not leading a double life, pretending to be wicked and being good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. <laughs> we think about it and we realize, well, yes, goodness is much less interesting than wickedness now that we think of it. But normally, when we think of hypocrisy, it's trying to appear good when, in fact, you're wicked, not the reverse. Or consider this one, um, when Algernon says to Jack, I hate people who are not serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Or this epigrammatic statement, quote, to be natural is such a, is such a very difficult pose to keep up. Hmm. Or one of the very richest, quote, in matters of grave importance, style not sincerity, is the vital thing. Well, for Wilde, in fact, style was important. Uh, it was how one constructed a self for the world to see, and sincerity, on the other hand, was tedious and boring. Well, we laugh at these inverted statements, but when we pause for a moment and think about their inversions, we realize that Wilde isn't just being playful. For him, as a writer, if you want to say something significant, you don't do it sincerely. You do it with style, a beautiful style that amuses people, a style which for, Ma, for, for um, Wilde means irony, indirection, and paradox. Indeed, the very statement itself that, uh, uh, as he says, um, in matters of grave importance, style is more important than sincerity. Um, is not just a statement, but a demonstration of a style of irony that is serious. But it's serious and at the same time amusing. We listen to it and we think about it because we've never heard of it that way before. Wilde then wants us to reflect on these inversions, these paradoxes, these epigrams, rather than just laughing at them and then dismissing them, because indeed some of them are indeed true. How often, for example, haven't we heard, haven't we seen someone laboring to try to appear natural, in which naturalness becomes itself a kind of a pose? Or consider this statement from the play, quote, never speak disrespectfully of society. Only people who can't get into it do that. It's true, when you think of it. Only those who high society refuses to accept tend to condemn that society because they're excluded from it. Well, throughout the play, when Wilde touches lightly on various serious subjects, um, he never does it directly. He never does it sincerely. But nonetheless, he makes us think about it through the force of his style. The third and final source of comedy in the play that I want to talk about that certainly makes us laugh arises from its status as a gently satirical comedy of manners even gentler, I think, in its treatment of manners than um, she stoops to conquer. Repeatedly, Wilde seems to present a satirical subversion of certain upper-class Victorian manners and prejudices, particularly regarding marriage. But then, before he pursues them very far, 
he steers quickly away from them before the satire becomes too pointed or too sustained. It's hit or miss. It's intended as kind of pinpricks of, of satire uh, rather than as sustained thrust. For example, consider the opening conversation about marriage between Algernon, a wealthy man of leisure, and his manservant, Lane. This conversation is brief, and Lane is not going to be a major character, but consider um, what it is that um, is suggested here in this um, opening. Um, as Lane comes uh, into the room uh, and reports on what liquor is available, uh, Lane uh, observes that I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely a first-rate brand. Well, of course, Algernon is not married. He has first-rate champagne. Algernon says, good heavens, is marriage so demoralizing as that, Lane? I believe it is. Very pleasant state, sir. I have had very little experience in it myself up to present. I've only been married once. That was in consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a young person. To which Algy languidly replies, I don't know that I am much interested in your family life, Lane. To which Lane replies, No, sir, it's not a very interesting subject. I never think of it myself. Algy then says, Very natural, I am sure. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Lane goes out. Thank you, sir. This scene ends with Algernon's reflection. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower orders don't set us a good example, what on earth is use of them? They seem, as a class, to have absolutely no sense of moral responsibility. Now, what is suggested through these little satirical thrusts in this conversation? Well, first of all, there is the satirical thrust at family life. Family life, that most idealized of Victorian middle-class institutions, is, Lane suggests, so boring, this man who has a family, that I never think of it, okay? Still another little satirical thrust, or, or pinprick, is that Lane, um, who is married, says he knows nothing about marriage because he says he's only been married once, suggesting that the experience um, of marriage, which he's heard is a pleasant state, is one he doesn't know much about uh, because his own marriage implicitly is not particularly pleasant. Uh, marriage is an ideal for most people. Algy wants to know about it, but in reality, no. Not very pleasant at all. One only hears about those things. Still another little satirical uh, moment is that when Lane mentions um, that he married his wife only because of a, quote, misunderstanding. That's clearly a euphemism, probably for getting her pregnant and having to marry her as a, quote, consequence. Well, this helps to explain why he doesn't find um, marriage very uh, satisfying or family life very interesting. And finally, at the end of the conversation, uh, Algy's comment um, suggests that instead of taking a leading role in society and serving as models, as we would expect that the upper class to which he belongs would, um, the upper classes are so lazy that like algae, they look to the lower classes or the working classes like Lane, including their own servants, to present them with models of marriage and family life worth emulating. And um, algae is disappointed that Lane has failed in this because after all, shouldn't, um, shouldn't those classes, as he says, um, uh, serve as a good example? Well, they've shown no sense of moral responsibility an inversion of where leadership and one would think moral responsibility in society ought to lie. So we get all of these um, delightfully suggested here, but they're not sustained. Uh, and as a result, um, we simply move away. And at this point, Jack enters. That's how we move away. He has come back to London from his country place to propose to Gwendolyn. Uh, Gwendolyn is Algy's cousin and Lady Bracknell's daughter. Well, when he enters, Algy uh, demands that Jack explain who Cecily is, and he brings out the cigarette case that Jack has left here in Algy's apartment on an earlier visit. Algy is consumed with curiosity. Um, 
Jack says, I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about that cigarette case. I was very nearly offering a large reward. Well, I wish you would offer one to me then. I happen to be more than usually hard up. Oh, that's no good offering a large reward now that the thing's been found. It's in your hand. Okay, Lane then enters with a cigarette case, and Algy takes it. Algernon then says, I think it's rather mean of you, Ernest. I must say, opening the cigar cigarette case and examining it, However, it makes no matter. For now that I look at the inscription inside, I find that the thing isn't yours after all. Well, of course it's mine. You, you've seen me with it a hundred times, and you have no right whatsoever to read what is written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to read a private cigarette case. Algernon says, oh, it is absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't. More than half of modern culture depends upon what one shouldn't read. Jack then replies, I am quite aware of that fact, and I don't propose to discuss modern culture. It isn't the sort of thing that one should talk about in private. I just want my cigarette case back. If you don't talk about modern culture in private, where do you talk about it? Well, you'll note here that what seem mere witticisms in this conversation um, are going to resonate with more important questions when Algy begins to press Jack on why he goes by a different name in the city than in the country. Um, when he reads, um, from little Cecily with her fondest love to her uncle Jack. Hmm. Jack? Who is Jack? Well, Algernon says, your name isn't Jack at all. It's Ernest. Jack says, no, it isn't Ernest, actually. It's Jack. To which Algernon, his friend, says, but you've always told me it was Ernest. I've introduced her to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You're the most earnest looking person I ever saw in my life. Well, my name is Ernest in town, and it's Jack in the country, Jack says. And the cigarette kiss was given me in the country, given him by his ward, Cecily. Now, what seem to be mere witticisms here resonate with more important questions for a while. First, this exchange about Jack's two names raises the important question of personal identity, one of Wilde's favorite themes in life and in art, including in this comedy. There is, for Wilde, as I've noted, no underlying self, and so there's no point sincerely seeking out some coherent identity. Instead, he suggests, one ought to fabricate and create as many identities as one wishes, as Jack has done, in a sense, by calling himself Ernest in London and calling himself Jack in the countryside. Different social sets demand different names and demand of him different personalities. Now, Ernest is then Jack's alter ego, or one might say Jack is perhaps Ernest's alter ego, depending. Similarly, Algy will later pretend that he is named Ernest, first in order to provoke Jack, but then in order to court Cecily. In short, both of these men, these friends, fabricate selves, though, as we'll see, Algy does this fabrication because he revels in the act of multiplying uh, personality uh, and in the chameleon trickery of being multiple identities, whereas Jack's aims in having this double life and two identities, both of them in a sense constructed, his aims are more purposeful. He adopts the false name of Ernest in London in order to court and marry Gwendolyn under that name because she demands that name of him. She will only marry a man named Ernest. Um, but nonetheless, these names that they go by and the particular uh, personalities associated with them uh, which are different depending on, in Jack's case, and whether he's in the town or in the country, um, they're just poses that they wear, um, names that they give themselves in different situations to construct different identities there. Again, though, the difference is that whereas algae delights in fabrication for its own sake, Jack would really like to have a single name. He'd like to have a fixed identity. Um, he uses the name algae simply in order to court Gwendolyn. And he's rather earnest then about this desire to be one thing, even though he isn't at this point. And perhaps it's understandable that he should take so little pleasure in this 
double identity that he's been perpetuating, um, perhaps it's understandable in a man who, after all, was an orphan and knows nothing about where he came from and who his parents are. Such an individual would want somehow to fix on something permanent and stable, even though for a while such things don't exist. Nonetheless, the fact is that both Jack and Algy traffic in masks and false impressions, uh, though for different reasons, and neither of them has anything resembling an authentic identity to get in the way. They both indulge not just in the inventions of uh, themselves as a figure named Ernest, but also in other inventions. Um, in the country, uh, for example, where Jack tells everyone that he is Jack, um, he says that he has a reckless younger brother whom he calls Ernest. Um, thus, he fabricates the idea in the country that Ernest is, in fact, his sibling. He says, my dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed in the position of a guardian, as I am, to Cecily, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on our subjects. It's one's duty to do so, and as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much either to one's health or one's happiness. In order to get up to town, I've always pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest who lives in Albany and gets into the most dreadful scrapes. And that, my dear Algy, is the whole truth because I have to then tell Cecily I have to go up and tend to my reckless younger brother, Ernest. <clears throat> um, now, this is then a convenience for Jack that allows him to go up to London to court Gwendolyn and to have fun by fabricating the idea that this figure, Ernest, at least for his ward Cecily and others in the country, is in fact not his alter ego, but his younger brother. All right? Meanwhile, Algy uh, explains that he has invented his own imaginary uh, friend, an individual named Bumbery, um, a permanent invalid who lives in the countryside and who Algy then uses as a pretext for leaving town when it's inconvenient and going into the country. But he says he also uses Bumbery as an excuse for getting out of unwanted social engagements and has been doing so for years. Um, he says, it lets me go down to the country whenever I choose because I have to attend to my invalid friend Bumbery. Bumbery's perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bumbery's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Will's tonight for I had really been engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week to dine with her. All right. It's a pretext, but it's all for Algy, a delight in creating this rather than as it is too often for Jack, a kind of practical necessity. Now, one of the questions then that arises out of this conversation about uh, fabricated identities uh, is who then in this play is really earnest? If we take the meaning of earnest to be sincere and straightforward, and if we take sincere and straightforward to be for wild something tedious and boring, who is earnest and who isn't? Well, obviously in that respect, Jack is more earnest than algae, notwithstanding the fact that they both uh, have alter egos. And as we'll certainly see at the end of Act One, uh, Jack sometimes runs the risk of being unbearably earnest. Um, he tells algae, for example, I am sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is clever nowadays. You can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. Your kind of cleverness in particular, he means. And at the end, of Act One, uh, when Algernon says, "Oh, I just love scrapes. They're the only thing. Get, <clears throat> they're the only things that are never serious." Jack again admonishes him, "Oh, that's nonsense. You never talk of anything but nonsense." Well, nobody ever does. Algernon says to this. Jack simply looks indignantly. He's becoming more serious. He's becoming more earnest, even though his name is not Ernest, and he's simply using that as a pretext to court Gwendolyn. Happily, while. Uh, he is doing so, it becomes pretty clear that although Gwendolyn wants a man named Ernest, she herself is not Ernest. And she makes this clear after Lady Bracknell forbids her marriage to Jack when she utters this hilarious statement that although my mother may prevent us from becoming man and wife, I may marry someone else and marry often. Nothing that she can possibly do 
can alter my eternal devotion to you. <laughs> I will marry many other men, but I will always love you. Now, she doesn't really mean this, I think, uh, in, a, in a straightforward way. Um, she's a creature of irony, and Cecily is too. Uh, they both speak in these kind of hilarious paradoxes, and we'll see, in fact, that is, is Cecily's lack of earnest, her irony, her paradox-ridden indirection, that is one of the primary reasons why Algernon falls in love with her, why he finds her so irresistible. But on this scale, then, of uh, earnestness and not earnestness, where does the indomitable Lady Bracknell fall? Ah, uh, well... Interestingly, Lady Bracknell is the least earnest character of all, and yet, as we'll see when we've returned to the play next time, she is also the one who pretends to be the most earnest. And with that, goodbye, and I'll see you next time on Tuesday.